Welcome to this moment in democracy. I'm Saladin Ambar. This episode was recorded on March 2nd, 2023. Today, I'm speaking to Steve Adubato. Dr. Steve Adubato is an Emmy award-winning anchor of State of Affairs and Think Tank, airing on WNET, the PBS flagship station, and NJPBS. Steve has also offered political commentary on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, The Today Show, and NPR. Steve is a proud Eagleton Institute alum, formerly New Jersey's youngest state legislator, and author of five books on leadership, including his newest book, Lessons in Leadership 2.0, The Tough Stuff, to be released this summer. Finally, Steve received his doctorate from Rutgers in the field of mass media. We are so pleased to have him. Steve, thanks for joining this moment in democracy. Great to see you. It's a great to see you, Dean, and, and to the entire family at the Eagleton Institute, the one and only uh, Eagleton Institute that I'm so proud to have a longtime well, connection with and be an alum from. It, it is definitely a mutual admiration society uh, to have you among our ranks. It's uh, it's terrific. Listen, I, you know, you, you clearly did have a very early start, a very young age to begin your career in politics. Um, what was that like at that age for you? And why and how did you make the transition to journalism? Uh, it, it's pretty simple. At, at 25 years of age, I was running for the state legislature elected in an, a very difficult swing district, as it's called. When that district had not elected someone of the party that I was in, a Democrat, uh, for a long time. I won that seat. And two years later, um, there was a landslide. The former Republican governor, the very popular Republican governor, Tom Kane won in a landslide. And that is one of the things I learned about democracy is when you're on that ticket, no matter how hard you campaign, if there's a landslide, the governor, uh, Governor Kane, the incumbent, won my district with 72 percent of the vote. And I remember losing 51, 49, 51 percent to 49, thinking, yeah, that's what happens. And so you ask how I got into the media. I had to make a decision as to what I wanted to do. Either I was going to run for Congress. or pers- continue to pursue a political career. And I thought, with the advice of some others, including some folks at Rutgers, who said, try another route. I p- started pursuing my doctorate in the School of Communication, Information, and Library Studies at the time at Rutgers, started a broadcast, started doing political commentary. And I thought, this is a meaningful way to try to make a difference. This is a meaningful way to use my skills raising money and organizing as opposed to running again. And that was a lot of years ago. And I, to say I've never looked back would be less than accurate, but I stopped looking back about 10 or 15 years ago and realized running for office, being in office was not the way that I would try to make a meaningful contribution. Rather, in public media and doing the work that I've been doing with a great team for a long time, I'm proud to be affiliated with public broadcasting. Well, it's it's a bit like that Robert Frost poem, right? The road not taken. You, you know, we look back and we wonder what might have been, and kind of um, oftentimes come to uh, you know to appreciate where we are. Um, do do you feel that being a, a broadcast journalist, doing the kind of work you do in the media, that that's been as rewarding in terms of making a difference, making the kinds of changes maybe that you hope to make in public office? Is is that right, or is that going too far? It's different. I mean, I, if I think all the way back to 1985, going into 86, you know, one of the things I was really proud of, think about as a state representative, you're, you're, you're a freshman, you don't have much clout in the state legislature. But I remember, I live in the town of Montclair, one of the first communities in the state of New Jersey to voluntarily de- desegregate their schools. Now, why is that relevant? I remember that I pursued and was able to get into the budget of $500,000 appropriation for the public schools in Montclair to help with transportation, uh, which is a key of moving kids back and forth within the town so the town could be more effectively integrated in its public schools. That was something I thought, wow, you can actually make a, a tangible difference in a community to try to pursue a public policy and that is difficult to achieve in any other arena. In the media, It is not as direct, but there's a book behind me. If people are watching on video, it's called Who Will Tell the People? William Greider wrote that book. And I keep asking myself, well, who will tell the people? And without being overly philosophical, I think as we speak right now of more and more folks who are cutting back meaningful news 
uh, coverage, analysis of public policy issues. And for those of us connected to public broadcasting, to be able to do that, do we change policy directly? Are we advocating, per se, a policy? No. Are we attempting to, quote, inform slash tell the people, as William Greider says in his book? Yeah. Hopefully that makes a difference with democracy um, hanging on by a thread. And I'm not engaging in hyperbole, as everyone knows. Well, listen, this is a, it's a number of times you, you've raised uh, this term making a difference. And I want to, if you don't mind, share a little bit about uh, maybe your childhood, you, you know, being a young <laughs> you person. You don't have enough time. Do, do no, no. <laughs> well, we're not going to get, we're not going to, we're not going to go crazy here, but um, I don't mind getting a little philosophical. I wonder, sure. you know, we have lots of older, but also lots of younger viewers and, and listeners to the podcast, obviously. And so I, I'm just curious as to what was it, was there a distinct mm-hmm. moment in your life and age where you said, you know what, I really do want to make a difference. What was that? Uh, can you share that with us? I, uh, it's a great question. I appreciate you asking, Dean. And I'm convinced, and I do a lot of leadership coaching and, and and seminars around leadership and helping people become better leaders. And the reason that's relevant is I often ask people, tell me about how and where you grew up, who you grew up around, because I'm convinced, Dean, that there's a direct connection between our childhood, those influences on us, where we grew up, who we grew up around and the way we lead, and frankly, who we are as people. Long story short, I was born and raised in Newark, New Jersey. The riots slash rebellion of 1967, I was a very young boy, um, seeing the National Guard, seeing state troopers with rifles. uh, As the city burned, as 26 people died in that rebellion, and racial tension being as intense as it was in the city at the time, My father was a very prominent leader in the community, um, leader of the Democratic Party in the area we grew up, later formed a very large and significant not-for-profit. He was in the middle of all that. I was a kid. And I remember, without going into a lot of detail, Mm -hmm. the violence, the tension, make January 6th, and with all due respect, well, I I shouldn't make that analogy because January 6th is still disgusting and horrible, but it did not go on for one day. It went on for many days, and the city was torn apart. And frankly, growing up around that and realizing that being involved in the struggle to try to make a difference and people trying to live together uh, with racial tension and polarization being what it was in a city where I grew up in an Italian-American neighborhood, most of the kids around me, most of their dads, their response was to fight back, push back, and say it's quote them Mm. and they were talking about blacks in in, in our community my dad told us there was another way to try to find a way my dad supported the first african-american to be elected ken gibson on the eastern seaboard sure Uh, i was part of that campaign as a teenager in 1970 and so the bottom line is i was forced to be involved because of my surroundings my father and my dad telling us if you are not part of the solution it's not only that you're part of the problem um, you're missing a huge opportunity to make a difference. And that's it's been with me ever since. I've never made the impact my dad did, but I try every day. Well, he sounds like a great man. I, I appreciate you uh, entertaining that question. I'm glad I asked it, frankly, uh, because I, I think uh, it, it does say a lot about what led you to, you know, undertake the career you've you've been involved in now for many, for many years uh, at this point. So I appreciate it. Um, and speaking of which, you have your, your your hands in a lot of cookie jars. You're doing a lot of things. You're a busy person. You have three television series you, you've anchored. You're also the founder of a nonprofit, Stand and Deliver, where you offer an executive coaching program. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? What what led you to get involved in uh, executive coaching? Is it uh, simply an extension of, of what we've been talking about, uh, mm-hmm. your desire to help um, make a difference and, and lead? What, what What is it about? How do, how do you sure. work in there? So here's the, here's the short and simple answer. Now, I, I've always seen leadership as um, it, it's an art form to me. It's not a science. And, and I connect leadership and the ability to communicate effectively. Dr. Martin Luther King is someone I studied uh, as a kid and continue to think about today um, because he was an extraordinary leader for many reasons. But one of those reasons, other than putting his life on the line and giving up his life in the struggle at 39 years of age, being assassinated, he was an extraordinary public communicator. And I became a student of public communication. And I thought, 
And as I received my doctorate at Rutgers in the field of communication, I thought, you know what? This is a gift. It's a skill. I need to not only develop my own skill to communicate effectively, but way more important than that, I needed to try to help others. And so I established a for-profit company called Stand and Deliver, providing leadership and coaching and, and, and development. And then we, with my colleague, Mary Gamba, uh, we started an organization, a spinoff, a not-for-profit Stand and Deliver program. It was leadership development for Newark children. And the story is simple. I read an article in the Sunday New York Times about Short Hills kids. Short Hills is a very wealthy community, all white, very wealthy. And they had a debate team. And then these kids go all around the country. And I thought, wait a minute, what about the kids in Newark? What about helping them to become better communicators? And so the bottom line is we created a seminar series in which we coach them to stand and deliver, to okay. share their message. Gandhi said, be the change. What we told them is be the change. Communicate what you believe needs to be changed in your community. Get up in front of others and do it. And they were scared to death to do it. And over 22 years of that program, we helped literally thousands of young men and women in the city of Newark who are now 30, 35, 40, become the communicators and leaders they're capable of being. And that's what Stand and Deliver the Not for Profit Initiative was about, was about, is about, because that's just one example of economic, racial, and social disparities that um, not only should not exist, but more importantly, like I told you before, what are you going to do about it instead of complain? For sure. And Steve, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm drawn to your background and deciding to get a PhD. Um, in your educational experience, now that you, you've had some time to look back, um, is there anything that you wish you'd have known or they had taught? And you obviously are in front of students uh, and have been in front of students quite a bit over the years. Um, is there anything you wish you would have known then in, in terms of in, by way of what they were you know, offering um, in the classroom that might have been uh, helpful for you along the way? So first of all, I'm looking forward to coming down to Eagleton. I know what I'm oh, doing. We're, we're thrilled to have you, man. It's going to be great. Um, March 29th. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to being with students, both in person and those who join us uh, online. And let me just say that, and if I don't say this, I'm doing a terrible injustice to the folks at Eagleton. Back in the day, if you will, yes, in the mm -hmm. 80s, when I was at Eagleton, uh, Dr. Alan Rosenthal, the late Dr. Alan Rosenthal, who headed up the Institute, a mentor of mine. Dr. Cliff Zukin, mass media, a mentor of mine. Dr. Carl Van Horn, a mentor of mine. I would not have pursued my doctorate at Rutgers if it were not for leaders, teachers, mentors like them. What I wish I understood at the time that I, I want to share with the students at Eagleton, anyone else who cares to listen, is that, you know, I used to, I don't want to get into too much detail here. I used to cut a lot of corners and think that my ability to communicate publicly could get me out of things. And Van Horn and Rosenthal and Zukin reminded me, just do the work. Hmm. don't spend time trying to figure out, I have a book over my shoulder on, on the video and it's called Extreme Ownership. It's written by two Navy SEALs. And the whole theme is about taking responsibility for yourself. And to me, that's a great part of leadership. For too many years, I thought I was too slick. I, I would call it, quote, the Newark way. I used to, it, it was an excuse <laughs> to get out of things. And I said, you know, it's, right. there, yeah. we used to call them Newark rules. And okay. often it was a way of, quote, getting over. And I did that for too long in all candor. And there were people who checked me as I needed to be checked. We all need to be checked as leaders, as people, and as students, as students at the time. And four times I tried to defend my dissertation, rejected every time. Mm. And the chairman of the dissertation committee, Dr. Jorge Chement, challenged me and said, do the work. Wow. Stop BSing. Stop wow. trying to explain your way into a, a doctorate. Do the work. Listen to the feedback. Don't be defensive. Fight that urge and do the work. My goodness. Well, that's, that's powerful to hear. And I think that will be powerful for our students. Uh, so again, thank you for, you know, agreeing to come to our class to undergraduate associates, as you know, uh, like the graduate fellows, these are um, students who are top flight, but also specifically interested in careers in public service. So uh, it should be a, it should be a great day. Uh, I was going to ask you about owning it in your book, your <laughs> new book, Lessons in Leadership. You, you, you spend quite some time 
talking about this concept. You want to, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, because I think I know what you mean. Um, sure. And having read, read the chapter and so forth, but why don't you just share a little bit more about owning it? What does that mean to you? So, you know, like I said, uh, there's, there's a tendency, Dean, for all of us to, you know, we have a 12 year old daughter and no matter, and she's a great, uh, it's a great student, works really hard and great dancer and, and competitive dancer. But if things don't work out, I notice, I'll say, Olivia, you didn't do such and such. What's up with that? And very quickly, as great, and she's a great kid, but she'll make an excuse. And the only reason I raise that is whether you're 12, 22, 32, 42, 52, 62, whatever it is, making excuses, defending ourselves is natural, but it's not great leadership. And so in the chapter that you mentioned in this new book, Lessons in Leadership 2.0, quote, the tough stuff, I say that uh, President Biden and Donald Trump, while they do not agree on much philosophically and politically, they have something in common. Too often they don't own it. Afghanistan, Afghanistan, the withdrawal, mm -hmm. an embarrassment. It was terrible, screwed up from A to Z. President, in my view, never really owned it. There were a lot of excuses. Donald Trump lives by excuses. Never his fault. He had... It's always someone else. He points the finger. He calls someone a name. He, um, it's just absurd. That's, that's the opposite of leadership. When, when Trump said what he did in the beginning of COVID, it's all going to go away, and then communicated public health messages that were life and death and dangerous, he blamed Dr. Fauci. Take it, respond, take responsibility, own it. And the president, President Biden, doesn't do it enough. And Donald Trump doesn't do it enough. And they're frankly, in my view, representative of too many political leaders who make too many excuses. They don't simply do the work, but then when the work goes wrong, you don't blame it on someone else because you put that, you put that cabinet secretary there. You put that person in place. And if you didn't do it, then you're responsible for that as well. So that whole theme of extreme ownership is something either you live by or you don't. And it's whether it's in corporate America or in government, public life or in university life, we have to own our mistakes and the mistakes that everyone in our universe makes because that's great leadership. The book is not about mediocre leadership. Lessons in leadership is about <laughs> exceptional leadership. Talking about it is yeah. easy, Dean. Living it, trust me, I fight the urge every day to make excuses. And I hear myself now and I get checked by others around me. And um well, I know I'm on my soapbox. That's what it oh, means. So, that's what happens when you start asking me about the, Well, that's all right. I, you know, uh, my <laughs> students will tell you uh, I come with my soapbox every every class. So, it, you know, it's it's nothing unusual for me. So I am with you. Uh, and it is a terrific chapter. I don't and the, and the book's terrific. I don't mean to be patronizing, but but it really is. And you have a number of great examples. Very kind uh, of from, you. Thank you. From from the NFL to Colin Powell. It's it's, it's terrific. But you had me reflecting on uh, John F. Kennedy and, and the um, Bay of Pigs fiasco when he, you know, famously accepted full responsibility in the aftermath of that. I was thinking, yeah, we don't, we certainly don't get enough of that uh, yep. anymore, you know? You know, and I talked about Kennedy in my previous book, Lessons in Leadership. And, the, and again, for our students, go back and look 1962, the Bay of Pigs. Talk about a disaster. Afghanistan, um, many times over. They screwed up. And Kennedy, to his credit, as you just said, Dean, he said, look, I trusted the generals. I did not question and challenge them enough. And so when they told us we could win in Cuba and we could do what we needed to do uh, as it related to uh, Castro at the time leading Cuba and his dictatorship, Kennedy said, I was wrong. I will learn from this. He didn't point the finger at general. Well, this general, General Jones told me such and such. He said, I'm the one who took that advice. I own it. And soon thereafter, uh, with the Cuban Missile Crisis, he used that experience from the Bay of Pigs to learn to be a better leader. So flaws and all about Kennedy, one of the reasons I still have my Kennedy poster leadership for the 60s, talk about back in the day, mm -hmm. um, is because imperfect, clearly, owning his mistakes publicly, absolutely, learning from them, that's what great leaders do. But uh, Steve, I, I couldn't agree more. And you know, if I'm not mistaken, his, his approval ratings went up after he came out and, and did this thing. I think people could relate. Well, you know what? Uh, let's give the guy a break. He owned it, as you say. And uh, and people want that. What they don't like is 
hiding, I guess. <laughs> yes, hiding but, but Dean, here's, here's the question. I'm sorry for interrupting, but no, please, this is a conversation. To, Feel free. When it, when it comes to a functioning democracy um, and leadership in public life, think about this. The, the obsession with making excuses, your political, well, my advisors tell me if I, if I, Trump, Trump was, 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 was great at this, meaning this is how bad he was. He, he was convinced that if he acknowledged the mistake, if he ever apologized for being rude and nasty and, and calling a reporter a name, or he would be perceived as weak. Right. The irony is, Dean, and you know this, and I know your students' common sense, regardless of their political ideology, this will tell them what I'm about to say. Acknowledging that you handled yourself poorly, that you lost control, that you contributed to a situation in a negative way and should have done X when you did Y, that makes you stronger. Trump was convinced it would make him look weak. The irony is not acknowledging his mistakes made him look weaker. You take the hit early on for acknowledging a mistake, but you grow from it and people relate to it, as you said, because who among us doesn't make a mistake every day? And learning from it and growing from it and taking responsibility, people respect that, in my view. Trump got that all wrong. I wish President Biden or any of other leaders would, would learn from this. You don't look weaker. You look stronger. Don't just say it, though. Mean it, own it, learn from it, and grow. It, it's such an excellent point, Steve. I, you know, again, uh, wholeheartedly agree, and we don't see it uh, nearly enough of it. So I appreciate you raising it. You know, um, I want to go in a bit of a different direction here. You know, you've you spent a career, a uh, very successful career uh, in communications, in front of a microphone, in front of screens, televisions, cameras, and so forth. But, you know, I feel in this moment, there's been this great, I mean, call it a withdrawal. Um, I feel like, uh, well, we've read, it's not a question of feeling, right? we've read about this epidemic of loneliness. We've seen a, a great deal of anger in our culture and in society and people's private lives. And so I, you know, thinking about your book and your work and, and, and your career, I, I was drawn to ask you this, um, what is it that leaders can do when we're in a situation where so many have seen to have withdrawn mm. and are lonely, angry, uh, simmering out there, I feel that very much. I don't know if that's your sense uh, from where you, from where you sit in, 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 in your day to day life, but I want I do wonder if there's anything leaders can do to speak to this kind of moment. You know, it, it's deep on a lot of levels, but I'm going to share a couple thoughts and. I'm not a fan of, uh, I often make fun of, and and I shouldn't, Dr. Phil. And the reason yeah. I do that is because he appears to be able to solve every problem and every issue, uh, not even not in an hour, because one hour, the show's an hour, but <laughs> it's actually 44 minutes when you add the commercials. But he can solve every situation in 44 minutes. I can't. And and I try to understand first. So let me, let me just tell you my thoughts on this. Please. First of all, in this new book, I added a chapter, I'm going to ask um, our, our, our team to send this to you, on wellness. It was called um, the, the Leadership Wellness Connection. And, and it's the last chapter of the book I wrote. And I hope it responds to your, your question about isolation and loneliness. So, and here's the, the way it works. I believe that pre-pandemic, only exacerbated by the pandemic, there's been a sense of isolation, loneliness, um, the level of mental health or the, the mental health challenges and problems young people face, all of us face, more real than ever. And so I wrote this chapter on, quote, creating a culture of wellness as leaders. And so what that really means is trying to connect with the people around us. Listen, my wife often says, I try to confuse our team that we work with, my family. She says, it's not your family. They're people you work with. And she's right, technically. And we can't be their family, nor should we be their family. And we're not a family. However, we can show that we care. We can show that we're concerned about their well-being, their family's well-being, and give them the opportunity. Yes, work hard. Do the work as, I, as we start at the podcast. Do the work. However, right. take care of yourself. Stop pressing people just to produce. 
Yes, produce have the highest standards of excellence. Trust me, I do. I'm difficult on a taping day when things go wrong, Dean. I have to tell you, my demeanor isn't what it always should be. I acknowledge that and own it. However, I have people can't see this, but this is on camera. Can you see what that says, Dean? Hold on. I'm, you're getting my uh, brief. Yes. Yeah, it says brief. Now, you may brief. ask, right. why am I sitting around with this? It's because before we got on the air, there were some technical issues with the internet. And I had this around me because I know it sounds odd. Just breathing for me, and I don't want to sound overly philosophical, reminds me of, hey, listen, it's a podcast. We'll get this right. Now, what does that have to do with isolation? Because we're living in this virtual world and we're so dependent upon technology. Uh, we can freak out when it doesn't go right. We can confuse this with being in person. And it's a long-winded way of saying to you, Sometimes we need to breathe for ourselves, breathe first, put your mask on first, you know, but think about those around you and what they need. A client once said to me, Steve, this is actually true. I was coaching this client on the West Coast and he was a banking executive, executive and he said, Steve, can you help me come across with my team so that it shows that I care? And I said, Bob, hold on one second. You asked me, can I help you come across and communicate as if you care? And I sent, asked him a simple question, Dean. I said, hey, Bob, do you actually care about the people you work with? And he literally said to me, you mean for real? And I said, yeah. And he said, I never thought about it. And here's why I share that. You asked me about isolation, loneliness, what we, can we do? Caring about people is not a technique. It's not an approach. Either you do give a damn, give a damn or you don't. Either you care or you don't. I can't teach or coach you that. Remind yourself to show that you care to those around you, those you work with and connect with them. So it's a way of saying to you, the fact that I'm going to physically be at, on the Woodlawn campus at Eagleton after all these years, just the fact that we're going to be in person with a few students. I look forward to connecting with those online, but just physically being together is a big deal and never, ever take it for granted. I'm sure I did not answer your question. No, I, I believe you did. I, I believe you did. Um, and I think um, it's one of those things. You answered the question. The problem uh, will, will be there. But um, sure. you, I think you've given us some tools, namely to be authentic about what you're trying to convey at, at a minimum. And that, more, authentic, yeah, that authenticity is, on that? is clear. Yeah, go right ahead. Be, be my guest. Up. Yeah. This is a tough one, and people may have a hard time with this, but I'm going to share it anyway. So we think about relationships. You talk about isolation. I think about friendships, relationships. I'm a student of building relationships, meaning I try to do it consistently, and I don't do it well all the time. But some of my closest friends, ideologically and politically, live in a world that I don't understand. I'm talking about people I grew up with. I'm talking about disproportionately Italian-American men, guys my age, contemporaries, who view the world in a way that confuses me. They will say things like, Steve, you know there's a civil war. I'm a student of Lincoln as well. So when I talk about civil war, I say, you got to watch using that term. Mm -hmm. There was a civil war over slavery. And so you tell me what this civil war is. And my, a lot of my friends, and someone said, well, how can you have friends who love Trump, who believed in, in the, who believe deeply in the MAGA approach to life and see, quote, you know, uh, let's get the libs and let, and, and believe January 6th was some sort of acceptable lunacy. Now I say that to you, Dean, because I've had to try to figure out how to navigate those relationships. Because they're not about political differences, like someone voted for uh, Obama and someone voted for McCain in 2008, when the late, great John McCain said to a woman who called President Obama a candidate at the time somewhat less than American. Right. I remember. And McCain said, no, no, he's a good man. We just, just disagree. Think about that. 2008. 2023. Dean, we can't even disagree with each other without demonizing each other. We can't 
have a political conversation without saying there's a civil war. My friends sometimes say, Steve, there's a civil war. And I have a feeling that when it happens, we're not going to be on the same side. And I think, and I'll, I'll say to them, what the hell are you talking about? What side are you talking about? I'm on the side of democracy. I'm on the side of trying to preserve this country. And we may see it differently, but how could we disagree on that? And they'll argue, often, many of them, that this war is coming and you have to choose sides. And I, it scares the hell out of me. And someone might say, well, why don't you just give them up as friends? Maybe it's a, a thing about growing up in an Italian neighborhood, you know, uh, lifelong friends. You don't give them up so easily just because they say some crazy stuff. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say something else, but well, well, but they say right. really crazy things. But they're but they're my friends for life, even if I don't understand them. And I try to avoid those conversations when they come up. They're tough, and it's not just about disagreements on tax policy. Yeah, I well, I think there's maybe a little bit. Of my, my mom's ancestors are from Sicily, so I, I totally understand. There's a kind of uh, <laughs> enough I get, said. I get my, it. I, I think so, I, I think I understand. Yeah. Um, you know, a little bit of the dynamic that you're articulating there for sure. Um, but, I, but I also appreciate the fact that you're, you know, you're invoking what the Greeks thought was important to democracy, that, you know, politics is an extension of the soul. And I think, you know, that's really what we're talking about, what you've been emphasizing in this conversation, I think throughout that, you know, um, it's not just a uh, numbers crunching game that these, these are real people with real lives. And, and I think that comes yeah. across in your work. So I appreciate that. Yeah. You know, uh, you know. So uh, as you say that, I think about this. So again, I don't care about anyone's political ideology. This is what I I often say this on the air. We do a series called Democracy at a Crossroads, and I'll often have people with different points of view on, because that's our job. And some of them, again, my friends will ask me, "Well, well, well, where do you lean? Which side do you lean?" I said, "You mean which way do I vote, or how do I conduct myself as a broadcaster?" And I'll say, "No, it's it's the same thing." And I'll say, "Okay, well, not really." Because my response is, I don't have a horse in this race. And here's what that means, Dean, to me. Mm -hmm. I'm not rooting for or against Trump. I'm not rooting for or against Biden. I'm rooting for an honest dialogue and discourse about issues and policies and things that matter in people's lives. Why is that relevant? Think about this. In the court case that's taking place as we speak right now, Dean, um, with the folks who manufactured the voting machines in 2020, Dominion, yes. in that case where people can't BS, they have to tell the truth. Some of my former friends over at Fox News and the chairman of Fox News, Rupert Murdoch, just said, we know our anchors, many of them, were intentionally lying on the air saying that the 2020 election was stolen, that the Dominion voting machines somehow were flawed and they contributed to this stolen election, which our former president took. And that audience on Fox News and Newsmax and other places, they bought into that. Now, why is it relevant to this discussion? Because it's one thing to have a point, <coughs> excuse me, have a point of view. It's another thing to intentionally engage in disinformation that contributed to what happened on January 6th, which con continues to contribute to political violence, which is the biggest threat to our democracy, including disinformation that perpetuates it. So it's relevant because those of us connected to public broadcasting, as small as our audience may be at times, is to have a meaningful, civilized discussion about complex public policy issues that impact people's lives. Wow, it shouldn't be that big a deal. But given what I just shared, and by the way, some of our friends at MSNBC and CNN, they don't do the exact same thing. But trust me, if a Republican did something extraordinary and positive, if DeSantis in Florida did something extraordinary and positive, I'm not convinced some of my friends and colleagues who come from, quote, left-leaning media organizations would report it honestly. That's not the same as the horrible things that went on in connection with the 2020 election at Fox and Newsmax, but just play it straight. Don't have a horse in the race. Right. Well, you know, I appreciate the honesty um, in, in these remarks. It's it, it's 
so easy to just gloss over these questions. And uh, and I'm sure, obviously, as you interviewed, interviewed, I don't know how many countless people at, at this time in your career, it, it's great when someone is just giving you who they are and what they really believe in a, in a comment. So I, I truly appreciate it. Um, as we wind down, Steve, I want to ask uh, just a basic question, which is, um, how can people find you and your work? What's the easiest way? Are you a Twitter sure. person or not? What do you, what are some of the ways people can look to get your work, your books, and see, find you um, uh, out there uh, on, on television and so forth? Sure. Um, on Twitter, it's at Steve Adubato, S-T-E-V-E-A-D-U-B-A-T-O. The other place you can find our work, two places. One, uh, steveadubato.org. S-T-E-V-E-A-D-U-B-A-T-O.org. That's where you can find our series Think Tank, State of Affairs, all of our public policy programming, and the leadership development work where the books come out of and and the seminars and the coaching. It's stand-deliver.com, stand-deliver.com. Yeah, I'm on Facebook, and uh, I (laughs) I used to write on Facebook. I only... Right now, it's about our daughter's dance competition, about a basketball game I went to. I'm a big basketball fan. Uh, I'm not going to say who I root for between Rutgers and Seton Hall, even though I'm a Rutgers grad. Uh That being said, I used to put things on Facebook, Dean, sharing my political views. And then all kinds of people, some of whom I knew, some of whom I didn't, would tell me what a horrible human being I am and how uh, and threaten you in 10 different ways. And I thought, why don't you just use Facebook to folks uh, put some family pictures up there? And that's well, all I do now. That, that, that's a shame. But you know what? Your, your daughter, Olivia, sounds awesome. So shout out to her and, and the Autobato clan uh, for sure. Thank uh, you, Dean. B- before I let you go, Steve, um, how do you keep hope? You know, we talked about maybe a few grim things, loneliness and so forth. How do you keep hope day in and day out uh, yeah. about our politics, about our republic? So I like to I like to say it's my faith, but then again, if people ever read some of the articles I've written, the programming I've done on my church, the Catholic Church, and then the hypocrisy and the politics in my church, um, particularly as it relates to, and I'm not going to open up that Pandora's box, but about how priests who molested young children, disproportionately young boys, um, were moved around and to to continue to. Um, wreak havoc on others. Someone might say, well, what does that have to do with your faith? I've struggled with my own faith. Not because there are bad priests, but because the leaders, the so-called leaders of my church, and I'll get to your question in a second, they protected those priests and, and more kids were harmed. Now, my faith in being Catholic is what it is, hanging on by a thread, but it's my faith more than anything else in the goodness of of people. It's that in the end, I have seen and continue to see, as you see, people trying to make a difference in the lives of others. I feature not-for-profit leaders every day in my work who do extraordinary things without a lot of attention. It's not so much what I see in government. It's not so much what I see in my church, the Catholic Church. It's what I see in people who try to make a difference every day. And I see enough of that, Dean, to give me reasons. And I'm sure this podcast for some people is going to sound morose and down, and I hope it doesn't because that's not my intent. But but I would say this. I see people who give a damn. I see people who care about others and show it every day. And more than anything, for our functioning democracy moving forward, I have faith that enough of us— will show that we care about others and care about preserving our democracy. And, um, you know, got to keep fighting the fight and do the work, as I said before, and pray a lot. Amen. On, 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 Amen. That, on that note, Steve Adubato, thank you, brother, for being with us here today. I am really excited for our students uh, and for you, because they're going to be wonderful for you as well, uh, for you to join us in person uh, near the end of March uh, at Eagleton in New Brunswick. It's it's going to be a great day. And this was a terrific conversation. I want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule to, to join mm-hmm. us on this moment in democracy. I appreciate that. And I'm honored to even be affiliated with Eagleton and be an alum of Eagleton. So being back there on the campus 
in that extraordinary building with those terrific undergraduate, stu undergraduate students is an honor for me. And it's, it's, it's coming home. It's going home and it matters to me. Thank you, Dean. Well said. Today's podcast has been brought to you by the Eagleton Institute of Politics. Eagleton is a nonpartisan research unit of Rutgers University, New Brunswick. This moment in democracy was made possible in part by the generosity of Gerald and Kiko Harvey and Eagleton's many supporters. To support Eagleton's work or sign up for its newsletter, click the links in the description. To learn more about the Institute, visit eagleton.rutgers.edu and follow Eagleton on social media. Thanks for joining us.